Good morning. Welcome to this Unitarian Universalist Church, which serves our church here in Birmingham, our church in Tuscaloosa, and all of our folks online. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are today, and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. This morning, we continue the celebration of our churches. This is our 70th year being a church. And this morning, I have the honor of unveiling an altar cloth made by Susan Barrow for our 70th anniversary. Is Susan here? I think she's still traveling. But when you see her, uh, make sure you come check out our platinum altar cloth in honor of our 70th anniversary. So thank you, Susan, for your hard work. To all who are here this morning, welcome home. Um, today, after church at 11.30, um, there will be a worship associates training in the sanctuary, and our reproductive justice task force is in the library. Downstairs in the Volcker Room, PSN and Dick Eccles will be discussing how healing the earth can start on our own piece of earth, the homegrown national park movement. On Tuesday, we are once again a polling place. Please sign up to welcome guests to our church and provide snacks for our poll workers. This Thursday, we will be going to Temple Bethel to see their professionally created civil rights experience exhibit. Tickets are $12 and registration is required. On Saturday, we are having an outdoor work day to clean up the playground starting at 9 a.m. We are trying to figure out if we have a large enough group to attend the church retreat in Highlands, North Carolina, June 6th through 9th. Please mark on your connection card if you are interested in attending. If we do not have enough folks, we will reschedule for another date. Next Sunday is our annual flower communion service. Please bring a cut flower for each person in your family for the ritual. Please use your connection card to sign up for any upcoming events, to get a name tag, or to request information. The office staff read these every week in our Monday staff meeting. On April, April 27th, we will have the UU Hiking Trail cleanup at 9 a.m. People and supplies are needed. If you are <laughs> bless you. If you are interested, please email Angel Johnson or select that you are interested on your connection card. Um, and then, hold on. Oh, um, today is your last opportunity to enjoy Steve Dunlap's photographs of Birmingham. Birmingham. Prices and instructions on how to make a purchase are in the loose leaf notebook on the small table next to the double doors at the rear of the sanctuary. You may take your purchase with you today. Um, please note that in addition Additional page is included to purchase a framed photograph, even if the one hanging is already sold. Please place checks or cash in the envelope inside the notebook. Okay. Uh, also, we have a few copies of histories of UUCB on the table in the narthex for uh, new interest prospective members for no charge. Uh, and I believe that is, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, and now Lee Martin.
can you hear me now? Okay. Um, next Sunday is our, is our meditation group. We're starting back up after the service. Yay! Uh, after the service during the RE hour, we will be meet, meeting weekly. We'll have a small, like a sitting, and then we'll be reading and discussing from a book, like a Pima Chodron Thich Nhat Hanh book. So um, if, if you, more information, talk to me after the service and looking forward to it. All right. All right, and Farah Tatum. And her better half. That's what happens when you get to the mic first. So CUPS, the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans, is celebrating Beltane on Sunday, May 5th. We'll be conducting the service in Julie's absence. She's going to be in Tuscaloosa, I believe. And Beltane is a celebration of halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So it's just marking down the, the sun's path through the sky. Uh, some of you may remember um, dancing the maypole back in school, back when they did that years ago. Uh, so we'll have our, our maypole out front. We'll have a bake sale. And Stepping on my toes. <laughs> she got the mic. He was just supposed to talk about what it is. <laughs> so um, if you remember, in years past, we've done uh, maypole out front for the kids and for really anybody who wants to maypole. So we're going to do that again this year on, on it's our May Day. So you may, and you may remember, like you said, we did the maypole when I was in school. Um, I'm f two and we, we did it and it's a lot of fun. We'll also have an auction that day and it'll benefit cups. Cups has been fundraising for a few years now. Our goal is to fix the steps that go down to the fire pit. Many of us cannot get down there without assistance. So that's our goal. So we're gonna have an auction that day. If you have anything you wanna donate for the auction, just bring it on to church and we'll take it. Uh, and there'll be games for the kids. Yeah, Heather, back there. Heather's gonna be uh, organizing the auction part. And there'll be- The other Heather. The other Heather. The other Heather. Um, they cover, Heather cover, how about that? There'll be games for the kids, bring anybody you want, bring anybody you know, we're gonna have all kinds of fun stuff out there. It's gonna be a party. Thanks. While we're talking about what CUPS is doing, I'm also gonna just side note, uh, CUPS has taken on the task of organizing the library downstairs. So I, I know some people maybe have come through and wondered like why the books are all stacked on top and it looks all herky-jerky. Well, we found books stashed in the cabinets and underneath, and it's just disorganized. Um, so we're also working toward organizing that as well with, with Heather's help. Thanks. Thank you. The prelude prepares us for worship.
please remain seated for the lighting of the chalice to begin, to start, to create, to undertake, to grow, to promise, to increase, to generate. All these are our birthright. As we are created, so may we create. The ability and the choice to create is sacred. To withdraw that chance from any person without their permission would be a violent act, the cutting off of life itself. And yet, as precious is the right to simply not, to end, to terminate, to stop, to discontinue, to rest, to hibernate, to impede, to prevent. These two are our birthright. For without consent, our ability to create becomes not a blessing, but a burden and an imposition. Without a space for no, there can be no trustworthy yes. Today we come to this holy place and time, ready to invoke the divine, to make space for the sacred, to co-create community once again. This too is a choice. You cannot, you may not be coerced into relationship with the holy or with one another. I invite you, I ask you to join us. I respect it if you will not, today or ever. More sacred than any other individual need is choice, the right to know oneself, the right to know what you are ready for, what you need, to stretch when you can, to pause when you will, to know your body, your mind, and your spirit better than anyone else, and ultimately to be trusted with the responsibility of your own living. And now, in the spirit of inclusivity and welcome, please stand and greet those around you, especially those you may not recognize. Folks online, please greet others in the chat.
it. Our opening hymn is hymn number 1013 in the Teal Hymnal. Please rise in body or spirit to join us in our opening hymn number 1013 in your teal hymnal, number 1013. Um, and now the Justice Minute. Code green, everybody, code green. It is Earth Month, and I'm so happy to have gas here. We have so many things going on this month. We have the plant sale, don't forget the plant sale, and also the talk with PSN and Dick Eccles about homegrown national parks after church today. And remember, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the pollution. Um, and then uh, gasp. Hello. My name is Jaleesa Milton. I am one of the co-directors of GAS, which stands for Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution. And that was a really cool intro to <laughs> But um, if anybody have, hasn't heard of GAS, we're an um, organization in the central Birmingham, central Alabama area that works to reduce pollution and to promote climate solutions and environmental justice. Um, and this is actually our 15th year, so we're really excited to have been around so long. Um, and I'm a fairly new director, so it's gonna be really interesting to look back and think through all the things that we've done in the area. Um, and so some of our work includes um, community air monitoring, so we teach people about how to understand air pollution, which is very hard, but very promising and very great. And we also do work to uh, provide legal solutions to some of the pollution in the area. I don't know how, who's familiar with Bluestone Coke or the 35th Avenue Superfund site, but we've been working with organizations in that area to make sure that they get justice for those um, those harms. So that's one of our um, things that we work on. And um, has anybody ever heard of ABC Coke? Yeah, their permit is expiring this month, so we're doing a lot of work canvassing and talking to community about how they can provide public comment about that, that facility. So yeah, it's been a long, it'll be a long month for us. Um, and I want to just do a quick um, plug that next month we're having our birthday party. Um, and it's gonna be at Cahaba Brewery, and it's gonna be on the 16th of May. So welcome everyone here to attend. Um, but thank y'all for inviting us. What? Common Ground? Common Ground? What's that? Oh, when's the movie gonna be played? On Earth Day, okay. So another plug for Common Ground. Which movie theater is that? At the Summit, At the summit. yeah, on Earth Day, which is April 22nd, right? So that's another thing that <laughs> you can plug. So thank y'all for always being such a welcoming community for us and partners for us, because we really appreciate it. Thank y'all.
Jaleesa, I want in on that protesting ABC Coke. You know, I, uh, when I moved to Birmingham, I could not understand why people washed concrete. Um, that is not a thing in the rest of the country. <laughs> uh, I understand why it's a thing here, but it is not a thing elsewhere. So we need to put a stop to that. And I won't be in Tuscaloosa May 5th, but this is a celebration. Uh, I have been elected to the ACLU board. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, I said, are you sure about this? I, I get in a lot of trouble. And they said, that's why we're asking. <laughs> so, but that's where I'll be May 5th. That's why Cups is going to be taking over the service. I have a board retreat to get me on board to do that stuff. Now is that time in our community when we share what is on our heart, whether joy or sorrow. For those of you online, please share your joys and sorrows in the chat. And for those of you in person today, I invite you to come and drop a stone in honor or in memory of what is on your heart. And if for no other reason, to come see Susan Barrow's amazing work. There's a part of this altar cloth that you can only see looking down on it. So please come forward.
Today we celebrate Aaron McCloyd, who successfully delivered Laura Jane uh, last Saturday the 6th. Big brother Thomas is so proud, so we look forward to seeing a new baby in a few weeks. Yes, yes, celebrate that. So delighted. And today we lift up Elizabeth Kuniff and her family on the loss of her grandmother, Joe Allison Taylor. So please keep Elizabeth and your family in your thoughts. And we also continue to lift up Piper Tatum, who is recovering from a scary accident, but we're glad that they are recovering. And uh, we lift up all of those affected by the Birmingham Southern College closing. That is really devastating to our community to have such a beacon of hope in Birmingham. Especially uh, Laura, who is a member of our community here, and Steve, who is a member of the community in Tuscaloosa. We also lift up the escalation of violence in the Middle East and continue to pray for peace and in that devastating situation. If you have updates you'd like me to share with the congregation, please let me know. May we keep one another in our hearts and minds as we go forth this week. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation followed by a moment of silence. Today's meditation was written by the Reverend Lynn Cox. Spirit of life, ancestor of the stars and the sun, you who embrace the vastness of space and us along with it, be with us today. Hold us in our worry, our exhaustion, our grief. Keep us close as we sit with our truth whatever that may be. Lead us to rest in the quiet, to find solace and renewal in this time of shifting light and dark. You whose arms open with the spinning galaxies, help us to make room as you do for all that is. Open our hearts to our loved ones, our neighbors, the beings with whom we share this planet. Lead us to reach out to others in compassion. Turn us toward one another in mercy, right relationship, and reconciliation. You who have seen the rising and setting of suns, of seasons, of civilizations, remind us of all that we have learned from the history of the world and from our own histories. Give us the courage to face our mistakes and to repair them whenever possible. Help us understand our interdependence our gravitational relatedness with all of the other spinning lives around us and lead us to treat those relationships with care. In this space, filled with the people among us who shine like stars, this space filled with a sparkle of love and care, we give thanks for this moment to be together. May our senses be open to the beauty of this day, this season, this world. Let us continue our contemplation in silence. Amen and blessed be. Will the children please come forward?
Good morning. Good morning, friends. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, friends in Tuscaloosa. Good morning, friends in the sanctuary. Good morning, friends up front. Y'all, there's all sorts of room over this way if you want to scooch this way, too. I just feel like everybody's over here, and I'm like, oh, okay. All right, so I have a story to share this morning. That's kind of a story. It's more like a thing to talk to y'all about. There you go. So did you know that there are trillions of tiny little creatures living inside your body? Sounds very scary, doesn't it? It's not, you're right, it's not. They're called microbiota, I believe. Some of you scientists may correct me, but just do it later. <clears throat> and they're so, so, so very tiny that to them, you and your body are like a planet. Craziness. So to my microbiota, I'm planet Courtney. I see planet Ramona over there. I see planet Miles over there. Oh wait, I see planet Gil way back in the back over there. Oh, there's planet Laura over that way. Oh, planet Elizabeth's right here. Planet Piper. So to our microbiota, we're like our very own planet. These microbes are so tiny that you can't see them, you can't hear them, and you can't feel them move around. Hmm. One microbe all by itself can't do too much. Scooch this way, friends, you're behind me. Sylvia, planet Sylvia, planet Piper, come this direction, you're behind me. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> But they'll live inside your planet body and depend on you for their entire life. So there you go. But if the microbiota are out of balance, you might get sick. Has anyone here ever been sick? Never? Never? I've been sick. Has anyone here ever um, thrown up? Nah. Sometimes. You've never heard that one before? I am very glad that you have not had to deal with that. But I definitely have, both mine and my children's. So, have you ever had a fever? Yep, yep, those kind of things. So, it might be because... Oh, oh. It might be... Because the microbiota, microbiota in your body planet are out of whack. Some microbiota protect you from other bacteria that make you sick. I heard someone call them germs, right? I did. Yeah. But sometimes the microbiota in your family and your planet body are fighting off those germs. Cool. But sometimes they help you digest food. And in general, if you're healthy, you can thank all of those trillions and trillions of little bitty microbiota for working together to keep your body in balance. So our bodies are like a planet, but our planet, Earth, is also like a body. Huh, crazy. And the people, and all of the people on the planet are kind of like the microbiota in our bodies. Whoa. So, so I'm microbe Courtney. Uh, oh, I see microbe Amethyst. And oh, here's micro, microbe Julianne. Oh, microbe Henry. So we're all microbes on the planet Earth. So, but just like the microbiota in our body, our planet body depends on you to help it stay balanced and healthy. Uh -huh. Our planet Earth depends on the people to help it stay balanced and healthy. We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, didn't we, Phil? We talked about it. There you go. I'm, I'm backing you up, Phil. So, <laughs> so 
So you probably know that our planet Earth, though, isn't very healthy right now, right? We've talked about that a little bit. There's pollution. There's global warming. There's all these things. But this is because the people have been out of balance. We'll talk in just one second, Henry, okay? Sometimes this feels like a really, really big problem for one little microbe to deal with because the earth is so big. But we can each do little things like biking instead of walking. Or biking or walking instead of driving. Wait, no, that works. <clears throat> we can do medium things like going to our state house and talk to the legislatures about things that we want to see happen in our communities to make our earth healthy. And when we work together, we feel a lot less like tiny microbes and more like the big important things that we all really are. Ta-da, the end. Yay. So, all right, all my microbe friends, let's go outside and enjoy planet Earth a little bit. <laughs> Courtney was talking about us being our own planets and our own micros, but I want you to think of us now as heroes. So who are your heroes? Uh, folks online, I want you to type your heroes in the chat. Folks online, just share them out loud. Who are some of your heroes? Just all together. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Didn't mean that one. Other heroes. Harriet Sorry? Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, yeah. I love it. I love it. So there are lots of fabulous heroes out there. Um, I didn't hear any superheroes, though. Do we have some superheroes? Aquaman. Aquaman. I was not expecting to hear Aquaman. Yes, yes. So of the span of heroes, we have superheroes. We've got Superman and Wonder Woman and Spider-Man and Miss Marvel and Shang-Chi. Uh, there are regular people whose life journey has presented opportunities for heroism, some of whom you named Harriet Tubman, Malala Yousafzai, Rosa Parks, Jane Goodall, Amelia Earhart, Nelson Mandela, and of course, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And William Barber, yes. We have deified our planets, our sun and moon, each other, nature, all things seen and unseen throughout the ages. Ancient peoples believed that their gods and demigods were their heroes. Those are their hero stories. From the mighty Thor to the wise Athena to the compassionate leader, the Jade Emperor in China, to Sango and Oshun in Africa, these gods were known for their mighty acts and their intervention into human affairs. Our culture has shaped our impressions of these gods so that in our minds we automatically label gods like this as mythologies while we expect another god to be labeled as one we either believe in or we don't that doesn't seem very fair we are surrounded by a culture that venerates an ancient mesopotamian deity 
as the one and only deity, despite the ancient texts of that deity, namely Exodus 20, verse 3, which states, you shall have no other gods before me. The term for this is henotheism. Have any of you heard of henotheism? A few of you. Namely, the belief of there being many gods in existence by which to choose, and the devotee choosing to believe that their god is better than all the others. The part that is often overlooked is that henotheism acknowledges that other gods continue to exist. They are just not the chosen deity. It is not until around 583 before the Common Era, while Israel was in exile, that the God of the ancient Israelites proclaims himself to be the only true God. But that's not the purpose of my sermon today. I'm going to let you all figure that out. As I've proclaimed to many people, it's not my job to tell you what to believe. It's my, go- it's my job to put out a buffet for you. So here's a disclaimer. When I use the word mythology, I am doing so from the perspective as a lifelong student of ancient texts. Myth or mythology within the concept of the study of religion does not mean falsehood as modern times have equated the word. And in fact, if you look it up, the falsehood is the second definition. The primary definition of myth means the study of ancient stories for ancient peoples which provide meaning and guidance, hope, and or education about natural phenomena, some of which includes deities or supernatural events. Whether or not the story is factually true or historically proven is a modern construct that we put on those ancient peoples. For them, it was the journey and not the destination, using what knowledge they had at the time and using their primary transmission of passing around stories over the campfire. But ancient peoples were never satisfied with the concept of gods who kept their distance from humans and demanded worship all the same. In so many cultures, their theologies described gods who mated with humans, bestowed God-given talents onto humans, and incarnated themselves to better communicate their lessons to humanity. I'm thinking of folks like Quetzalcoatl and Hercules and Jesus. The stories of heroes were powerful because the ways they moved and inspired and built communities around those stories, bringing the divine a little bit closer to humanity. The more we have brought the stories of those heroes from the divine realm to humanity, the more nuanced and realistic our stories have become. Holding our heroes in wholeness with their brilliance and their bigotry alike, recognizing their imperfections as well as ours, our heroes become attainable, grounded, like us affirming our value that living within each individual is a hero to someone else. It affirms the power and strength of our individual selves to create beauty and peace in the world around us. The only difference between ourselves and our heroes is notoriety. Each of us have brightened the life of someone else, whether we know about it or not. You are a hero. Heroes are role models. They give us hope 
They help us to connect with one another. Heroes give us purpose and remind us to stand up for our beliefs and for other people. Heroes inspire us and challenge us to be our best selves. We need to share stories of hope, especially when life seems hopeless. Here in Alabama, when we talk about heroes, especially in the context of this congregation, we have specific folks that manifest in our minds. During the lifetimes of many of us, or our parents, or our grandparents, the civil rights movement birthed heroes among us from our congregations in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa. I say that not vaguely, but specifically. We speak of those who fought, who marched, and some of whom died during that movement. Which is why to this day, when I am introduced as a Unitarian Universalist minister in Alabama, I physically feel the significance of the life-saving work that we do each day to bring hope to the despairing and healing to the wounded. The stole I wear when I preach is symbolic of the burden that ministers take upon us on our ordination, part of which is honoring the shoulders on whom we stand. This week, I met our accounts manager at WBHM who wanted to hear more about our church. Not everyone knows the stories about this church, although for some of us, those stories are repeated so often they are a part of the fabric. Some of these stories you can tell better than I can, and I encourage you to do so. Today we are celebrating the 1960s in our churches, and it's nearly impossible to separate the civil rights movement from this period of time in our churches. It's just near impossible. I still have not been able to get a hold of the history of the Tuscaloosa Church, and I hope during your member moments you can help fill in some of the pieces of your heroes in Tuscaloosa. And obviously I'd love to hear that as well. During this part of our church's story, the 1960s, segregated spaces were still illegal. No, I'm sorry, segregated spaces were still legal, legal. I just want them to be illegal so badly. Uh, our churches served as white allies throughout this movement. And while this history is not more important than the movement led by black leaders, it is still important for us to remember our heroes during this time period. Ancestors like Eve Girard, our church receptionist for over 40 years, uh, from the very beginning of the church, nearly the beginning, who during the civil rights movement answered many hostile phone calls during her work hours. Bomb threats to this church were nauseatingly regular. Can you imagine how awful that must have been for the congregation at the time? One day... She was frustrated by the number of bomb threats that had already been called in. And so Edna declared to the next caller, if you want to bomb this church, you'll have to take a number. <laughs> Her courage in the face of those threats is one of the first stories new folks at our church often hear. How many of you have heard that story? Yes, it is, it is that regular amongst us. So that's why I'm voicing them today so that everybody knows. Our founding minister, Reverend Dr. Alfred Hobart, was so connected to the movement that his children felt it at school. 
His daughter and son were both excluded from activities at their schools because their father was that activist minister. Maybe one day my children's schools will label me that. (laughs) Reverend Hobart was for a while the only white member of the Greater Birmingham Council for Human Relations, an integrated forum for the discussion of race. In 1961, when the Alabama Education Association invited journalist John Ciardi, uh, who had written an article titled, Jim Crow is Treason, to speak, Alabama Education Association had invited him to speak, Moms for Liberty, I'm sorry, I mean white supremacist, (laughs) objected to his speech, and while the AEA withdrew their invitation, Reverend Hobart invited Ciardi to speak in our church to an integrated standing room only crowd in a time when integrated spaces were still illegal. On the morning of September 15th, 1963, Reverend Hobart was in the middle of his sermon when he was passed a note informing him that the 16th Street Baptist Church had been bombed. As an ally, he had the news earlier than most, and he said from the pulpit that nothing could be said in the face of such a murderous act, only action would suffice. And the church took a quick offering, ended the service. Midway through, Reverend Hobart rushed to the scene while church members Ed Harris and Peggy Fuller reached out to the girls' families. Two of the girls who were murdered that day were part of a program run by this church to prepare students of color for integrated classrooms. And the girl who lived, Sarah Collins Rudolph, has been a friend of this church for many years and has spoken here numerous times. Reverend Herbert Oliver, a Presbyterian minister who served a local church during the time of Reverend Hobart, wrote this. For years, the Unitarian Church in Birmingham, under the leadership of Reverend Alfred Hobart, has had interracial meetings of various kinds in defiance of the threat of bombs. It is the only white church I know of in Birmingham which invites black speakers from time to time and goes out of its way to encourage black folks to attend meetings. I cannot say this of any other white church in Birmingham regardless of how gentle or liberal the pastor may be in personal relations. Now that is a testimony of our church. According to our resident historian, Dr. Jean Weaver, whose book is available after the service, free for newer members, and which is quoted heavily throughout this sermon. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Our congregation was the first integrated church in Birmingham. Are you all asleep? Yes. That's important. That's a big deal. We should have that on our logo. Um, at At our first permanent location across from the zoo, and I just want you to think about what's across from the zoo right now and how important it was to be an integrated space in that space as well. That's not to say that our spiritual ancestors got it right the first time. As I said before, the more human our heroes become, sometimes there are things that don't go quite right the first time. The first vote to integrate our space failed. It's hard to hear. But considering that second vote was only a few weeks later, it is likely that that first vote was the way it was because of the time period, because there was a fear of threats to themselves and their children, 
And the clan was very much around and doing lots of horrible things. The Klan was regularly detonating bombs in public spaces, in integrated spaces, 23 over a short period of time. But still, the congregation's commitment to creating an integrated sacred space was only one of the ways that the congregation supported the movement. Registering black voters, supporting freedom riders who were integrating bus travel, and inviting black ministers to this pulpit at a time when it was illegal to do so, those things were essential to the cause. In the 1960s, as sit-ins spread from North Carolina to Birmingham, as Jean writes in our church history, Unitarian women adopted the tactic of arriving at the lunch counter ahead of the scheduled arrival of the black students. They took a seat and ordered and remained seated when the students arrived and asked to be served. The women showed that at least some white customers would not leave when black folks sought to join them, showing support in the face of protests by other customers. Are any of our sit-in folks with us this morning who participated in those? Anybody? Yes, yes. Those sit-ins were so important. The only way that that worked was the fact that the Unitarian Church was working with those black movement leaders to find out when the sit-ins would be. Through members Anne and M.P. Gray, Graymont School was integrated, and Anne spoke out at a teacher's meeting at Woodlawn High School, saying she would welcome students of color in her classes. Imagine how that was received at the time. Our 300-year-old piano was gifted to us by the Gray family. They are with us this morning in a different way. Our second minister, Reverend Larry McGinty, with the board approved the organization of what would become a Head Start program to help prepare six-year-old students for integrated first grade. It was the nation's first Head Start program and it successfully integrated students in Birmingham, and it was through the hard work of church members here and their minister. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that we were the home of the first Head Start? That's awesome. I know, I'm excited about it. During the Selma to Montgomery March, members of this church provided home hospitality so that dozens of people from around the country could join that march. One of those marchers was the Reverend James Reeb, who was marching with two other Unitarian ministers when they were brutally attacked, and Reverend Reeb died from his injuries. Just three weeks later, Viola Liuzzo, a Unitarian from Detroit, was also murdered by the Klan for supporting the civil rights movement. We have Unitarian martyrs in our generation. That is a profound statement to make. We have Unitarian martyrs from the beginning of our tradition, but also some recent ones. Our history is filled with stories about how Unitarians were on the forefront of racial justice in the 1960s, doing their part as best they could. Our founding member, Dr. Joseph Volker, the father of UAB, who worked to integrate UAB. Imagine the force that it is today. Laura Knox and Marilyn Sheffield formed a dance company with integrated dance classes, again, at a time when it was illegal to do so. Charles and Bernadine Zukowski 
supported Planned Parenthood right from the very beginning, and we carry their work forward in all of that good trouble. Charlie Cleveland, who I've lifted up recently, who is in his last days, he worked with Mayor David Van to restructure the mayor's office into its current form, creating a mayor and a city council as opposed to a mayor and a commission that it was. And in doing so, Charlie Cleveland got rid of Commissioner Bull Connor. <laughs> Ethel Gorman, who is the director of the Jefferson County Board of Public Health, held workshops on the effects of racism and appointed black leaders to serve on important committees. And Virginia Volker was a pivotal force of change, and she requires an entire sermon to herself. So many heroes are a part of our 1960s, and I can't lift them all up this morning without being here for hours, so I'm just going to say, pick up a book. <laughs> we live in a liminal place in history, beloveds when many of our civil rights heroes are still with us. Although as time passes, those heroes pass away and their stories have the potential to dwindle away. We also exist at this strange time when there are so many people who would prefer that things went back to the way they were before the 1960s when inequity was rampant and white supremacy reigned. Our democracy is on our ballots this year, all the way down the ticket. Our Unitarian heroes didn't create the civil rights movement. They didn't even do most of the work. Nor is the work finished. But they chipped, yes, it is not finished. But they chipped away at the bigotry. They did their part to make the world a better place. When we learn their names, when we remember their struggles, when we repeat their stories, when we celebrate their victories, we carry their flame forward to the justice issues of our time. Racial justice, queer justice, reproductive justice, environmental justice, and so many others. Dr. Joseph Volker said once, to be a Unitarian in Boston is almost fashionable, but to be a Unitarian in the Deep South requires courage. We all know this to be true. We are not the fashionable church. We're not the most easily understood. We confuse a lot of people. <laughs> but the work that we do collectively and individually matters. We gather on Sunday mornings to nurture ourselves, to be in loving community, to feel that safe space so that we can replicate it outside of these walls. We do that, we gather here and fill ourselves up so that we have the bandwidth to march, to write letters, to plant trees, to call legislators, care for the marginalized, attend school board meetings and library board meetings, to build beloved community, to integrate more spaces, to radically welcome others, to expand voter rights, to make abortions legal again, to read with young children. Are you hearing me? Yes. To work our polling place to support libraries and schools. And so much more. 
Our transformation here is life changing. Our love together is life saving. Our collective work makes a difference. How will we be remembered? What will they write about us in church histories of the future? Our forebearers made this world a better place, and we are called to carry their flame. Let us set the world on fire. My name is Kate Staub, and I am a member of the board. Our church is supported by those who call this church home and by those who support the effort of our church to change the world for the better. If you are a guest with us today, you can just pass the plate when it comes around. You're our guest, and we're just glad that you're here with us. As we heard earlier, our share the plate is for GASP. GAF's work centers on the notion that solving the problems of air pollution and environmental injustice requires transformational change. You can support GASP by making a donation today. We split our cash plate with that organization this month. Or if you're using PayPal, Venmo, check, and you want all of your donation to go to GASP, you can just note that on the memo line. We appreciate your donations by placing them in the plate mailing a donation to the church or using those digital payment methods like PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle. Thank you for your generous support of our church and of GASP. May we give in love and in hope.
Please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, and then be seated for our extinguishing of the chalice through the postlude. If you would like to join our church this morning, please come forward during the closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 170 in the hardcover hymnal. have a new member this morning. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm the Heather Cover that Farah and Grant spoke of um, to give me donations and that I'm going to be working on the library. I'm a retired librarian. A librarian. Um, happily married to my husband, John, who is going to be now uncomfortable because I pointed him out. And uh, I've been attending off and on for a year, and I'm a member of CUPS. I officiated it this morning online. And uh, looking forward to growing and assisting and just being part of this com community. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Heather, will you support this church in all the ways you possibly can? And church, will you welcome Heather and John into our community and love on them and get them connected? We extinguish this flame, a mere wisp of matter in process, almost as insubstantial as the thought of it. Yet our civilization has harnessed the power of such a flame to drive and shape a new world. So may it be with the power of our thoughts 
that in truth and love they may drive and shape a new world. We are part of the connective tissue that holds the legacy and future of our faith. We are the children of freedom fighters, visionaries, and radical liberal theologians. We are the phoenix rising out of the ashes of the McCarthy era and the civil rights, women's, and queer liberation movements. We are the survivors and beneficiaries of youth-led and youth-focused beliefs and programming that encouraged us to be change makers, boundary pushers, and institutionalists at the same time. We are and will be the ministers, religious educators, congregational presidents, organizers, and social change leaders that our faith calls us to be. We wear our faith as tattoos on our bodies and in our hearts, as testaments to the blood, tears, dreams, and inspirations of our community ancestors and elders. So may it be. Amen. Mm -hmm. 